I'm waiting for the market to crash. Then I'll buy up big, right? Rewind back to part one if you haven't heard it yet, where we discuss why the Australian property market is so much more crash resistant than some people will lead you to believe. To prove why it's so important that every property investor understands this, let's say I'm wrong about everything I said in part one. Let's play along here. Using five key points, I'm gonna walk you through why waiting for the market to crash is just a comfortable lie that people actually tell themselves. And it's not a strategy that successful property investors actually even use to build wealth. Stick around to the end where I'll actually share exact example cities where in the past their housing markets did weaken. What did actually people do with this data? Did they do what people think they're going to do or say they're going to do when housing crashes occur? Firstly, I want to take a step back of this theory of waiting for a crash to happen. Like I said, going to assume that I was wrong in part one and we're going to play along with this idea that no the crash is happening when people are thinking of the crash happening let's look at their ideal state the ideal state they're hoping for is that their life is perfectly intact everything that they do in work health mindset financial capacity and capabilities all good to go except house prices is just so much cheaper it's them on an island and they're ready to purchase just them no one else matters, just them. And they make a purchase and they purchase something with high confidence and feel like everything's perfect now. And they just sit back with popcorn waiting for prices to rise. Well beyond what they purchased, well beyond the previous highs for them to go, ha, ah, I nailed it, right? That's what the perfect outcome people are seeking when they say this. Now let's actually talk through those assumptions where I said, no, I'm wrong here. Um, those things are not going to happen from part one. A crash is coming and let's just see if this is actually a good idea to wait for this. The first part to understand is the makeup of the job market that's impacted if Australian property markets crash. And I've got some data to share here with you that you'll find of interest. The first thing here is that approximately $150 billion per annum is the aggregate residential property industry's direct contribution to the Australian economy. That is 150 Bs, billions, B big ones, right? Like massive spending and dollar impact here. And I just want to break down the contribution. Like it's not just construction, it goes further. It's not just that annoying sales agent and annoying buyers agent that you want to stop hearing from. I'm talking like real impacts. So there's crane operators, they could be real estate agents, property managers, they could be builders, plumbers, sparkies, air conditioning services. I'm sorry if I've just botched your employment name up there, but I mean, I'm talking everything. Furniture sales, renovation sales, hardware. Hey, well, if you don't want to impact you know, the confidence there of um, not just the actual the building of the kitchen, what's in your kitchen? You might put less food in that kitchen because you don't have one of those job people and you're actually impacted by it and I'm just trying to say here that the flow one's massive, right? You get where I'm coming from. That's what I'm trying to basically say here is that the industry impact, that's just direct. I didn't even talk about indirect. That's direct is $150 billion of impact. So, you know, there's over 200,000 subcontractors in Australia reliant on the industry. No small number. Uh, there's also tens of thousands of small businesses and there is over 1 million direct employees. Now, these are not small numbers. I just want you to imagine that these numbers are just the direct and what about the indirect? Like I talked about that example, but what happens when a million employees in certain industries connected to real estate lose jobs or are impacted by it because the industry or the asset class is suffering? Those people might not go to that restaurant as much or at all. Those people might not use Uber Eats or Uber much because it's a luxury to have and all of a sudden they don't want to do that luxury. What happens to all those people who rely on gig economies? I'm just talking the flow on is massive and people don't get that. They think that, hey, real estate crashes, therefore I'm going to lick my lips and everything's going to be perfect. Well, if that was to happen, firstly, could you have been one of those 1 million in a job impacted by it? Could you have been one of those 1 million that then flowed on and then impacted everywhere you work because they don't want to spend money 
where you work or your business or your job. I'm a cafe operator. Well, guess what? There's less coffees coming in if there's less people with jobs in the country. Well, I'm in a unique specialized industry. Well, trust me, there is probably some flow and impact from real estate that comes through all the way your way. And if it doesn't, just the thought of impact that someone else is having in the industry economy leads on to what we call sentiment. For example, a business owner who's not in an impacted industry, here's data of Australia as a whole impacted. Do you think that that business owner is then going to go, well, I can't wait to go and take out more loans, grow my team, grow my employees, attract more talent and grow the company? Uh, you'd be surprised if everyone thinks like that. They would go, well, everything's bad. People aren't spending much. Spending trends are going down. And they may make decisions even before it impacts their industry to then cull down or structure and, and look at it that way. So it just shows you that the impact first from the employment perspective is huge. And there's even more charts that go through certain percentages. So for example, if we're looking at unemployment or employment, sorry, in construction and property industries as a percentage of Australia's total employment, construction services was 6.1%. Heavy and civil engineering, 1.2%. Building construction, 2.7%. Property operators and real estate services, one5 Now, that's more than 10% just there in these four direct industries, right? That is huge. It's like 12% roughly just in these four direct industries, not even talking about the indirect impacts. What if we talk about the output of construction industries as a percentage of Australia's total output? Construction services, 7%. Heavy and civil engineering, 2%. Building construction, 4.3%. So that is now 13.3%, not even including property operations and real estate services, and not even including any of the direct impacts in other ways. So it's clear, like, if everyone's waiting for the crash to happen, are you telling me if that crash does happen, as we're assuming here, that everyone's just in perfect, happy, and flowing economic environments and jobs to be able to afford all the properties? What about the mindset? This is the crazy part, right? Because the mindset is the next part. Even if your job, which I highlighted before from the business owner, was totally fine, Remember, if many people are losing their jobs, I want you to go back to COVID. Your job may have been fine. I hope it was, by the way. But if it wasn't, you're part of the group that wasn't. Do you now tell everyone that your job's fine? Or do you spread what's happening in your life? People talk. And so you could be fine, but then the people around you may not be fine. And the stories that you hear are a high proportion bad news stories than good. What does that make you do from a mindset perspective? Are you telling me you're immune and you're just a perfect decision maker with a clean mind, a clear mind, who's just, you know, driven to make investment driven decisions all the time? The majority of people don't. You will hear the news around you. You'll see the news on the TV. You'll see jobs falling off. You'll see industries impacted, flow on impacts, weak sales data because of the input construction jobs and real estate jobs, property industries, and supporting industries is massive in the country. And so that will then flow on to your mindset and you will be paralyzed because the many people in COVID, when that happened, do you think everyone perfectly timed it well and bought a house? The transactions fell to lows before they went to highs. So in the times of the lows, there was an element of physical capabilities, which was difficult. But remember, all the solutions to those physical capabilities started coming up very quickly. Virtual inspections, transactions, lockdowns weren't the whole year. There were a couple of weeks and they went back again. So it actually means that people were able to transact, but did you? How many did? How many more people decided I should have transacted? Well, guess what? Vendor discounting during that period of COVID. So the people actually going, I'm ready to let go of properties pretty cheap only was very low for about three months. So get that, the biggest lockdown pandemic things that we've seen in recent times, in recent human history, that shut all of us out, lasted for three months of weak vendor discounting before trends started changing again. Would you have been resilient, capable, and comfortable to make the decision in those three-month windows to score yourself a bargain? I don't think many would, because the data says many people weren't. So that's a core thing there. Now let's take a next part and look at this next note I have around credit because job impacts is one thing that impacts your income earning ability, but the 
global or national markets as a result of even property being impacted, how many of you will then have credit that's easily available? Because guess what? If a property crash is happening, do you think the banks are going to sit there and go, hey, there's a crash happening. We're just happy to give out money to everyone easily, like no tomorrow. Let's just give it all out. Because you know what? We know those assets that you're buying are priced perfectly. We know where they're going to be. They're not declining, right? I mean, they're going to be priced. No, they're declining. So if the crash is happening, they're all declining. Every time the bank gives out a loan, by the time from when it's actually given you the commitment of pre-approval up until settlement and the valuations occurring, if there's a risk for the bank to actually be below LVR, they might bring their loan to value ratios to 90 to 80, or they might even say, we don't want to lend in this postcode. We see too much risk here. And what if that postcode's everywhere? Then what? They're in the business of lending and they're not going to be able to lend. Well, they might start to turn on the lending taps temporarily because they might say, well, we need more people with more money to go buy stuff. But if everyone's in this thought of, no, I can't buy, I can't borrow, I can't earn, I don't have as much jobs, or I'm feeling lack of confidence because everyone in my friend circle or others are impacted by these jobs, or Australian Economies Week, and the bank doesn't want to give out money, there's going to be a period where people don't get that money. But then what happens if you're maybe one of those impacted jobs or impacted economies as a result of the flaw and of the crash? How will you have the comfort in your economic conditions to go and take or borrow for money? Yes, post-COVID, for example, we saw a lot of stimulus and activity come back in lending, in finance, which can be a delayed impact once the banks see the money's not being taken. They want to make it more available for you to take. But if a crash is happening, that's asset prices actually crashing now where they might start to go, hey, do we want to lend in this area? Do we want to give money to these type of people in these type of occupations impacted by this? So the availability of credit at the first phase may not be easy to get. And usually availability of credit is also one factor, not the only one, but a factor. It wasn't clearly the factor when prices rose during high interest rate rises because people took up credit and they still, without having high availability of it, borrowing capacities decreasing, still did it. But what happens if after 40% of capacity borrowing, we said 2024 crash, right? It's already down 40% in borrowing capacities. What happens if it went down to 50, to 60, to 70? Surely there's going to be some limit where just there's not cash buys everywhere. And if that happens, then how do you buy? Even if there's a crash in front of you, how do you buy? So this is the one part of credit availability, credit comfort, and credit take up if you're not feeling confident about your job or employment positions off the back of that happening. So this is like dangerous level of thinking, right? If you're thinking, I'm just going to go and make sure everything I can do and buy in this market because it's crashing and I'm going to nail it. Well, I've just given you three core points. Firstly, is the impact of the economics of Australia when property construction as a whole has flow and impacts. Second is the mindset of the investor and what they will do when they're in that environment and using COVID as a reference point to many moments where people didn't act. And then the third part is actually credit availability and take up your confidence from what employment you have and or will have and the ability for you to decide to take it up or the banks and the postcodes, whether they give money or not. So it's really important here to realize that it's not just as simple as executing on it because there's a crash happening. But let's go a couple steps further. If that crash is what you're waiting for, and if it's about to happen, do you think you're the only one waiting? Is it just you sitting there going, I'm here by myself, I'm the only one waiting for this crash? I think there's going to be others like that groupthink mentality who are going to sit there waiting for it. This is the part that will really make you go, well, I didn't think of this. Imagine prices go down from $1 million to 950 to 900K to 850 to 800. We'll keep going. 750, 700, 30% off. Was everyone equally going to wait for 30%? Did everyone as a group talk to each other and go, G'day, mate. Um, just want to chat to you. What are you guys waiting for? When we when should we buy? Are you guys waiting for 30%? 25, 20? Oh, you're doing 30? Yeah, cool. Me too. Um, the whole street said 32. We should all just wait for 30, right? That'd be the perfect time. We'll all just well, no, they're not gonna all wait for 30% to happen. There are people who see value at 5%, 10, 7, 20. What happens if people who found value at 5 and 10% was a higher makeup than people who were sitting waiting for 20 and 30? That bell curve or that you know curve that's starting to emerge, the hockey stick, 
starts to come back. Just when it declined to five, you're getting your popcorn out. You're getting, honey, we're going we're gonna to go into 20%. It's going to come. It's happening. Let's do it. It's around the corner. And everyone thought value was 5%. Went down 5%. This looks like a great time to buy. I'm getting back in. You can't control the breakdown of bandwidths that every person around you, owner, occupier, renter, investor, thinks that there is value in a market. Your value points are different. Therefore, at every percentage point from zero to 30% in decline, there could be inputs of sales volumes that are coming back up. That means at 5%, there could be a new volume of sales coming in because people saw value there. At 10, and one of two things happen. You might see the blip and you might jump in. So you're now Mr. 20% or Mrs. 20% decline and you saw the blip at five. And you're like, I better not miss out. I better jump in. I better jump in. Now you've just aided the 5 percenters to come back up again. Or you might go, no, it's coming. And then every six or seven or eight, you're like doubting yourself again and you might bring it up from 20 to 10. So how do you know that? How do you control that? And if everyone else is looking to come in because of the crash, at the time of coming in, let's just say it's all perfect. 20% down, you all waited, which by the way, is impossible. Everyone agreed together that we're going to wait for 20% dump, jumps, 20% uh, dumps in value. You all jump back in and all of a sudden you're saying you're not going to have any competition when you're all buying at the same time. No, John, you go first, please. It's uh, my, my pleasure. You take that first home, it's yours. Uh, I'll have the next one, don't worry. Um, hey, he doesn't know we're going to get it. 21% decline, not 20. We'll let him go first. Hey, like, uh, come on. Like, I was just like, this is just getting silly, right? I, I'm sorry if I know this is a really important topic for people who are like, I've been waiting for the crash and I wish, but I want you to please laugh with me here. Get a bit of like, hear this out and just be like, okay, I'm never going to think like this again because it just cannot happen perfectly in this perfect world that I'd imagine. Because you're going to wait here for everyone to think there's no competition on the way in. That's not how it works. Now, let's move on to the next part. If someone is selling 20% cheaper, there's a crash happening. Firstly, it means that there are conditions in play where they have to sell. So let's go through this. You have to sell property. Where do you go live? Just have a think for a minute. That means you're banking on lots of rental housing to be available. No people coming into this country. Lots of houses that have recently been constructed and available for a position. And lots of choice in cheaper markets to also be available. And this is when many people get it wrong. If you think everything's going to be available and you're going to be able to sell off your problem because times are tough and the market's crashing and then you're just going to grab something else, that is not how it always works. Because someone at the bottom of the chain who might be looking to also have their stock available, where do they go? Like, does a 500k property person go to 300, 400, 300, 200, 100? At some point, there's like no houses available in a price point in a respective city. So there's a bottom point reached. Now, if no one at the bottom point reaches the point that they need to sell, and then they start going to somewhere else to live, like you start having some like massive exoduses. You have to have like crazy scenarios. You have to have scenarios like people have to go to another country. You have to have scenarios that people just pack up and leave there. Like there has to be like doomsday stuff here right, of every possible scenario that everyone just leaves everything. That's pretty bad. Now, we've got bigger problems than just, you know, uh, what investment and where do I buy and buy at the bottom if that's happening. Because at, at some point, all these brackets keep falling up. Someone's got to leave. Housing is shelter, right? And you think that there's like a type of shelter and therefore all these houses should stay available? Well, no. The 35% of houses that might be renter properties, there's still shelter for people renting. And then the 65% of owner-occupier properties that still shelter for people where they're living as a home that they own or are trying to own. So like there's still shelter to all types of people. So that's one element. You can't treat this as some trading stock where you're perfectly valuing a company. You've got to remember there's an element of human psychology, human impact, human you know, decision-making that is there in real estate that's not quite there in other assets. Hey, look, prices are down 20%. Let's just go live in the streets. Like people don't sit there actively agreeing to this. They don't do that. Like if prices are down 10, 20%, maybe now it's not a good time to sell. Oh, but I have to sell. Is there something else that we can buy that's way cheaper so it feels and takes the pressure off our family? So you have that domino effect. that's constant switching. People aren't just going, I'm just going to live in the streets. Now, has there been scenarios where that happens that can happen, but people are going to try and avoid that. So this is the element of human resilience kicking in. Even if a crash was happening, something may have a response to it in another way. Might be supply. I just don't want to list it. It's a bad time to sell. I don't want to. 
So all these elements start kicking in. And unless there's something so massive that people literally shift countries and leave Australia as a whole because they cannot you know, survive in conditions that are here, whether it be living in, whether it be finding employment, whether it be jobs, whether it be wars, whether it be things like that, a local soil that's happening. Like we're really talking doomsday stuff here. And I'm not saying those doomsday stuff can't occur. There's been wars and things in the past, but there's been a higher proportion of people who believe that Australia is their home and it's a better place to be than other parts of the world. And that higher proportion of belief alone, just sitting here and living here needs shelter. And that shelter means there's a roof on their head. And that means it's either a rental property or an unoccupied property. And it means that they probably don't want to leave it. So if they don't want to leave it and it's a rent, rental property, then the person who owns it probably wants to collect an income and own it, right? And if they don't want to leave and it's an owner-occupied property, then guess what? They're not going to list it. So you see, like, the, the impacts that are huge, it has to get to such deep levels of doomsday scenario that the most common response will be, probably don't want to list it. And if they do want to list it, that means they have to go somewhere else. So somewhere else is gaining a positive. Do you see what I mean? Because if people are leaving one area, they're going somewhere else. Unless everyone's leaving the country, there is always going to be some place in Australia that receives the movement of people within the country. And this is the old saying of markets within markets. Even during the weakest of times or the biggest of impactors, like COVID, we saw people leave a certain type of dwelling type, leave a certain type of city and migrate to another. Did two cities get negatively impacted by COVID? No, one did, one didn't. One benefited. So if the flow of movement is within Australia and people need to shuffle for affordability, downsize, upsize, job impacts, repayment pressures, all these factors that are coming in that we could raise that happens in a crash, there is some recipient, if it's within country, not some deep doomsday scenario, that's for the positive. And so that place as an investor, if you're waiting to buy, you look for the recipient of that people movement. So that's the key here. So this is one of those core points of people movement and how that impacts it, right? So, and I didn't mention one more thing, and this I'll throw in there as a little bit of a bonus. So thank you for sticking around if you're, if you're here. Uh, some years ago, I had my master's degree project, and this was to go deep into banks and analyze um, you know, a, a particular line item, which was the net interest margin, where I ran an assignment on actually understanding it deeply as part of you know, my, my analysis of financial markets. And when I was looking at it, there was a particular piece there where I found of interest, which was the impact of net interest margins locally versus globally. And this is why Australia is a little bit different. The first thing here is that with Australian net interest margins, uh, at the time of making that assignment, these numbers may have changed, CBA's net interest margins, which is the earnings from lending essentially, was about 74% at the time of doing that assignment. So 74%. Now, it could have been 72, so I could get my numbers slightly wrong here, but it's in the 70s. Then you go back to overseas, where obviously when property crashes happen, the prominent impacts of it have been pretty great. Uh, Bank of America was an example I used to benchmark it against, and that was in the 50s for net interest margin, which means that their way they got their earnings was much more diversified in the Bank of America than it was for CBA. And CBA is, as you know, our biggest bank here. So... There's an actual reliance that's needed as attached to the housing market for CBA to do well. And remember, when CBA does well, it's not just CBA, the yellow logo that does well. There's also going to be 50,000 plus employees, their families, and where they go spend money. That is no small number. Then there's employees of subsidiaries that they own or are shareholders in. Then there's the super funds and the mums and dads who have super and have their stock allocations to blue chip shares, which many do and super funds do, of which banks are the recipients of those monies because they count as that blue chip share that's sitting in there. And that means the banks are paying out many monies to Australian shareholders and super funds. So you can see like the importance of their success is critical in the country. So when they're successful, it flows on. And guess what? They're not going to be successful if housing crashes are A, occurring and B, sustained because net interest margin may be impacted because they're not collecting interest on the money if people can't afford to and look at the flow and impact that will happen. So you can just see like if that happens, it's so much more damage than you can think of. Would you really be in a position to buy it if you're one of those impacted employees or employees of the people that they go spend in, uh, their money on or the super funds that are impacted and how you feel about your super balance looking at it all day, it's just coming back to the psychological points. 
But now to bring it home, I want to bring it home in examples. So examples are rays of a certain city, just to show you how even when that crash is literally right in front of you, there's a chance that you just don't make that decision. So let's go back to the markets here of Townsville. That's the first one. And I'm looking at data here that Townsville showed a house price retraction from 2013 every year. I'm talking a median price of close to 370K in 2013 came down to as low as you know, 300K in 2018. Like some people might go, well, that's not a crash Arjun. Well, double digit price declines, no price growth while other markets are growing. And at the same time, long-term averages of towns will be five to 7% long-term over 25 to 40 years. But you're seeing negative movements. That's a pretty bad amount of you know, growth during that time or pretty bad decline during that time. It just doesn't feel that way because of how many years it occurred over, but it is bad performance. Now, during that time, unemployment rates were very, very high. Like if you see that 2016 unemployment reached almost 11%. Crime was very high during that time too. So if you take a step back, how many of you hand on heart were gutsy enough to purchase properties in Townsville during that point? Because I'm looking at all the stats, sales volumes was very low, construction fell off and became low, unemployment became high, so locals weren't going in there, crime was high, people were hearing brand, bad news stories. People were scared about natural disasters, employment, crime, lack of house price growth, trends falling. How many of your friends said, nope, I went and bought their during the crash and they found the crash and I bought there perfectly? Or how many people actually perfectly bought in 2019 as the crash reached the bottom? No, we waited for trends to pick back up and then we started buying there. I bought there for myself and now the trends are rocketing back up. But that's me buying like at a later point, right? I'm talking about all those people who wait for the crash to happen. The majority of Australians did not do that. They did not wait for the crash to happen in Townsville and suddenly buy there. The same with Perth. Yes, many people are jumping into Perth now, but Perth's crash, if you look at prices 14 all the way to 2019, they declined a lot. Unemployment was trending up all the way from 2012 at under 3% or just close to 3% and moved all the way up to 6.5% at 2018. So doubled unemployment terms, prices declining. But how many of your friends in 2017 and 18 said, I'm going to go pick up properties in Perth? The years following the recovery happened but people did not perfectly time the crash there. What about every year is declining? Sales volumes are coming off, unemployment was increasing, locals weren't transacting much. So waiting for the crash, that's six to eight years, you could have been investing elsewhere, right? Because that's what happens when one city goes down and things go elsewhere. Rather than licking your lips and trying to perfectly time the Perth market or Townsville market, you could have made money elsewhere during that five, six, seven, eight year period. During that same time, you could have invested in Sydney or Melbourne in the early 2012s, Hobart, Devonport, Burnie, Tasmania, all around Tassie in 2016-17, regional Victoria across 17-18, could have gone to then these markets as the recovery now starts coming. So the main thing is, in summary, waiting for the crash is not a good idea. You likely may not be in a position to buy, borrow, whether it be mindset, employment, financial capability, and combine it with the likelihood based on you to perfectly nail a 10 becoming 15 or 20% when the hockey stick emerges and people may buy at different value points. And to finally show proof that the whole country was not buying Perth properties as it declined or Townsville properties as it declined. They waited for recovery trends to happen. Lastly, with opportunity cost, if you waited for the recovery trends to happen and weren't investing your dollars elsewhere, you would have missed out at between 50 to 100% of gains whilst waiting for Perth to crash and Townsville to crash in those six year periods. You could have invested elsewhere getting 50 to 100% gain in house prices. So in summary, if you're one of those people waiting for the crash, it's not in your interest unless you're gonna perfectly execute on a strong job with strong finances, a resilient mindset, and in a position to make decisions whilst you're waiting for that crash elsewhere, wait for the crash, perfectly time it, and also, not wait for the 20% because you can see the percentages happening at five and recovering and you pick it up perfectly. Look, let's be honest, the chances of that happening is very low. And if you want to gamble your chances of your future success with wealth generation to all those fundamentals occurring at once, then you're in for a rude awakening and, and probably likely to play catch up in life later parts of it. 
Just go to the casino instead. Red 21 is way more fun. Like Red 23, Michael Jordan, Kobe, number 24, two of my lucky numbers, by the way. Um, you know, chuck in there. You might have a better, better luck, better time, and be more fun. Thing is, crashes aren't good for anyone. They're not good for you. They're not good for jobs. They're not good for the country. They're not good for housing, shelter. You're literally saying, by being one of those people, you're literally saying, I hope for mass job losses in the country. I hope for displacement of Australians all across the country. I hope for people to not make decisions and time it at 5% peak, uh, below peak. I want people to wait till it's 10, 20 and let me go first. And then when I go first and get it, I want to be able to have all the money, money I can borrow to get it, not be told I can't. And I don't want anyone to bring my mindset down and, and not have any negative talks with me. I want to be by myself and you just don't talk to me. I'll be having no social experience or interaction with anyone. And I want to go and make money. So all those people on the sidelines sitting about housing crashes, jumping on the social media comments, chucking them in or whatever, saying, oh, you got this wrong. It's going to crash. It's going to put that aside. Put your gain or someone else's gain or loss aside in wealth and measurements of prices. You just ask for these five things. That's extremely selfish of someone wanting that to happen. Housing prices as they have over the last 40, 50, and 100 years will continue to grow. There'll be different elements, some wage-driven, economic-driven, property-driven. The key there is that it won't grow the same everywhere. It won't grow the same by percentages in all locations the same way. And some will have declines in some parts of it, but they won't last forever. Because if you're hoping for them to last forever for your gain, you're asking for those four or five things that I mentioned to occur. And that is not cool at any level. Don't forget to like, subscribe on our YouTube channel for more content like this, where I go into the data and beliefs like this. And hey, this series thing was pretty fun. Part one, part two, going into that. If you have more ideas for a series, we've done a few in the past from SMSF as one and going into that deeper, uh, trusts and accounting world and going into that deeper. If you have more series that you think I'd love to go through the part one to one to three or one to two or one to 10, if you want me to crank it, um, let me know and drop it into our comments in the YouTube page or drop an email over to info at investigate.com.au. Give us a share to your friends and family as well who are keen to learn more about the property market in 2024 and get informed ahead.